Well, good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Very special night indeed. Lots of great mojo here in the house. Yeah? A lot of great work and a lot of love in this room. I know that for a fact because I know a few of you and those of you who uh, I don't know, I know that you've been touched by this, this amazing woman up front here. Yeah. And he's Juan Sanchez, and this is Laura Burian, who you, you know is Dean here. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we moved to this area, to Monterey, 27 years ago, and my wife was in the first class that, that Jan taught here at the Monterey Institute, when well, it used to be the Monterey Institute of International Studies. So we go way back, huh, Jan? Yes. We'd like to dedicate a couple songs to, to the work that, that for me represents everything that, that Jan has worked for for so many years. And um, this is a song uh, written by Dona Peña um, called Mano con Mano. It says, Mano con Mano, hand to hand, Corazón con Corazón, heart to heart. Somos la gente, we are the people, la unión, the union. Somos solidaridad, we are solidarity. And I, I, I work with children. I open a little art center called Palenque Arts, and, and I teach, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, I teach the kids, you know, we, when we do science, I say, mano con mano, hand to hand, corazón con corazón. Right? Somos la gente, we are the people, la unión, in somos solidaridad. And they say, what's well, solidaridad? With solidarity, it's like, well, it's, you know, you put two hands together, you become solid with one another. You become one. Sometimes we forget, right? Like when somebody falls down, I tell them, when somebody falls down, you join their hands. That's solidarity. You hold them. When, when somebody needs an, an embrace, when somebody feels alone, that's solidarity. And I think, I, know, I don't know any, anybody who's traveled the world more than this woman. <laughs> I know that that's what... She, what she is, and that's why she wanted to be, and she's been going to all these places and bringing us all together in solidaridad, being solid with one another. So I hope you enjoy it. If you catch the words, this is Spanish 101. I know we're in a language school, so I'll sing along. All right? <laughs> Somos la gente, 
la unión, somos solidaridad. Por la justicia fue crucificado, por la victoria resucitó. Traigan la madera, traigan los clavos y el tormento, la muerte, no resucitaremos. Mano con mano, en tu hand, corazón con corazón. Somos la gente, la unión, somos solidaridad. Mano con mano, hand to hand, corazón con corazón. Let me turn up the volume. Somos la gente, la unión. Somos solidaridad. Mano con mano, hand to hand, corazón con corazón. Somos la gente, la unión. Somos solidaridad. Somos solidaridad. Somos do one song, so we're going to do two. Uh, I actually had a few songs that I had ready for her just to throw her. You know, there's a, there's a poem by Leon Felipe. I'm from Spain. I'm from Malaga, Spain, the birthplace of Pablo Picasso and Antonio Banderas. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and there's a poem by Leon Felipe who who um, wrote during the Civil War in Spain a poem called Ya no hay locos. There are no crazy people in, in the world anymore. And this is, ya no hay locos en el mundo, ya no hay locos. There are no crazy people. Se, se murió aquel manchego, that man of La Mancha, aquel estrafalario, that weird person from the, for La Mancha died. ¿Cuándo se pierde el juicio? Yo pregunto. When do you lose your judgment? I wonder if it's not now that justice is worth less than... Dogs urine, says the poet. And we locos. I hope you can be as crazy as she is. But, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> She's like, uh oh. <laughs> we haven't practiced that. We're going to do another song. We're going to do a Nico Nicolas Guillén um, poem called La Muralla. Let's make a wall, a wall of hands. Black people bring me your black hands. White people bring me your, your white hands. It's a wall that will go from the beach to the mountain, from the mountain to the beach, all the way to the horizon. Nicolas Guillén was a Cuban poet who was one of those poets that, that, that spoke for freedom and for people of different races to gather together. I had the pleasure of, of being in Cuba last year, and I know you've been it gone many times, right? So let's, let's build the right type of walls, shall we? Yeah. yeah? yeah. <laughs> When you hear tum tum, that means that somebody's knocking on the door of the, of the wall, you can say, ¿Quién es? Tum tum! ¿Quién es? Of course, good things in life are going to come. The children of the world, we're going to open the wall. Abre la muralla, which means open the wall. Can we say, Abre la muralla. Abre la muralla. Hey, in Spanish, one one, they're all going to get it. And the crappy things in life, you know, hatred and all this pervasive Happiness that we're getting on a daily news feed. Sierra la muralla. Which means close the wall. So thank you so much for letting us be here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
para hacer esta muralla Tráiganme todas las manos Tráiganme todas las manos Los negros, sus manos negras Los blancos, sus blancas manos Una muralla que vaya desde la playa hasta el monte Desde la playa hasta el monte Desde el monte hasta la playa Allá por el horizonte Ahí vamos Let's try again.
I can't join you in person this evening, but I am delighted to welcome all of you to the Institute, both personally and on behalf of all of our students, staff, and faculty. I'm grateful to acknowledge the launch of the Jan Nippers Black Fund for Human Rights Protection, the occasion for our coming together tonight. And I'm even more delighted and truly honored to pay tribute to my dear friend and colleague, Professor Jan Black. Now, many people will have a lot of profound and noble things to say about Jan. It's impossible for those of us who know and love Jan to refrain from doing so. I'll mention only a couple of things about her. First of all, in 2011, I came to visit the campus as a candidate for a faculty job. Like all such candidates, I had a packed day. I had a public lecture, I had back-to-back -back meetings with faculty, staff, students. It was stimulating and it was welcoming, but by the end of the day I was pretty beat. The last person on my schedule was one Jan Black. I knew Jan by reputation. She's a world-recognized expert in Latin American studies, which is my field, but I had never met her. I came into her office, there were tall piles of books and papers, many of you know what I'm talking about. Jan was there talking with William Arrocha. She got up and she said, I have a plan for you, Jeff, and she led William and me to a bar on Alvarado Street. We drank wine, we talked about music, we talked about the arts and military dictatorships, as one does with Jan, you know. That second Chardonnay, I was thinking, God, I hope they offer me this job. They did. And we've been drinking wine and talking arts and politics ever since. Now, Jan has been at the Institute for more than a quarter century. Her influence is felt globally around the world through the hundreds of students that she's taught and with whom she seems to be still in nearly daily contact. Her influence is likewise felt in the character of who we are and what we do here at the Institute, particularly in our commitment to human rights which we celebrate this evening. As the dean of a school forever improved by Jan's vision, her service, her enthusiasm, and charm, and as a colleague who came here partly because Jan plied me with multiple glasses of Central Coast Chardonnay, <laughs> I raise my glass, figuratively at least, to you, Jan, in gratitude and with profound respect and friendship. Thank you. except when I need to see. <laughs> and, uh, I uh, sometimes think I'm going to remember what I have to say, but it um, doesn't always work that way. Any, anyhow, welcome, and wow, thanks, thanks to you all for being here. I think this is the most, the best looking audience I have ever seen. <laughs> I'm sure I have never seen so many of my best friends in the same big room like this before. That's simply wonderful. Um, well, now, now that. Uh, I'm, I'm getting into putting, finally getting into putting my, my money where my mouth is. I uh, have, have hoped I won't have to have too much to say tonight, but, uh, but I, I will have to start, of course, by thanking the people who have made this happen. I, I, I have helped where I could, but this really hasn't been my deal. It's, it's the work, first of all, of Shirley Coley, the uh, director of the <laughs> She's 
put in endless hours on this. It's wonderful. And uh, Barbara Burke, the uh, executive assistant to the vice president. To, uh, Yeah. How about that for time? <laughs> anyway, uh, I was just about to say that nothing happens at the Mono, at the Middlebury Institute without Barbara. <laughs> um, also, I I want oh I, I I want to thank Shirley's team too because a lot of the people working with her have put in long hours and Jason there and, and Ava and uh, Lene and many others. And, uh, and of course, I want to thank the um, co-sponsors. That would be the United Nations Association, the Peace Coalition, uh, and the um, Monterey, <laughs> I keep saying Monterey, I just the Middlebury Institute uh, uh, Amnesty Club. Um, and uh, and then of course the musicians. Wow, that was fantastic, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I'm sure I would have been able to draw all of you here just for that show. It's wonderful, and it's not over. They come back for the reception, you know. And uh, let's see. Well, and and of course the speakers. Uh, the executive director of Amnesty International USA and uh, majority leader of the state senate, Bill Mining, who is not a guest here. I mean, we're, we're very happy to have to have Margaret here as our guest. Bill's no guest. He this is his home. In fact. Uh, I, I think of him as, as the security blanket for the Central Coast. <laughs> and now I see we have Sam Farr here. I didn't know we were going to have him. That's fantastic. Sam is still in some ways to, uh, to Washington. Um, now, I, I did want to tell you just to just a little bit before we go on with this about what I had in mind, what I have in mind about this fund. And uh, it, it's a two-part thing. The, we're launching the first part tonight. This is uh, about a scholarship for Monterey Institute student, students to do voluntary work for Amnesty International and, and, and just to make it financially a little bit easier for them to do that. Because I, I've always felt uncomfortable with, with um, internships and things like that that don't pay. And so I, I can't pay enough <laughs> with this sort of thing. Um, but I... Uh, well, and, and, and it's not like I have just won the lottery or anything like that. So I am kind of hoping that my friends and loved ones will, will step up and help us a little bit just to keep this thing going as long as we can. And I know you're doing it already. I, Shirley tells me we're, we're getting some, a lot of help, and I really, really do appreciate that. Um, Oh, I, did, I was going to mention that the, the, there will be a second installment to this program, and it is to underwrite a speaker's, speaker's series on human rights, uh, an annual event for um, usually in the spring. And uh, to go with that also um, an award for alumni alumni who have done particularly outstanding work in human rights. And uh, I'm, I'm not at all sure yet when that's going to happen. I hope it will happen sometime 
this fall, maybe uh, maybe late October, or early November, somewhere around there. And I may not I may not be uh, able to to be a part of that, but uh, well, I'll be presenting. <laughs> and but I I would hope that it will go on regardless. Um, now. Now let me uh, introduce our guest speaker tonight, Margaret, who is a uh, dynamite. <laughs> Absolutely a keg of dynamite. Um, as as um, executive director, she is in charge of a membership of a million people, more than a million and uh, a budget of something like 40 million. And, uh, and it's growing all the time, the membership and the donations. And I think she's, she's in, entitled to much of that. Now, we have to give a little bit of credit to Trump. <laughs> <laughs> but it's mostly for Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, anyway, this is no big deal for Margaret. She's been speaking truth to power for a very long time. I think she's, she's been a campaigner for human rights all her life, probably, certainly, certainly since her college years um, at uh, at Georgetown and then at Columbia, where she studied international law and human rights. Her focus was really on all of that. And since then, she has been had leadership of something like half a dozen other organizations in human rights. She um, has also worked with the U.S. Senate um, Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, among the many organizations she's worked with, I, I know you would recognize the Robert Kennedy um, Center as one of those. She has a, a, a purview that covers, it, it's global, it's inclusive. Her role has not just been to energize uh, Americans to think about human rights, but of course to connect uh, NGOs from the United States, particularly with with institutions overseas that we need to be working with. We have to pool our interest with uh, United Nations Association, inter-American organizations, and that sort of thing. Um, but there was a bit of a turnaround with 9-11. Uh, I, my first thought when 9-11 when came along was, oh my God, the war on terror is going to be a war on rights. There's no way around it. That's exactly what it's going to be. Uh, that, that it, you know, one of the biggest threats is going to be fear itself and the militarization that that can bring about. And uh, I wrote about all this, but then I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> Margaret really did something about it. She put together a coalition of 300 organizations to, to get out there and make sure that people were somehow protected and that people especially understood what they were up against. Um, since, since that time, uh, Margaret, came over to Amnesty, that was in, in 2014, and then she became the executive director in, in 2015. And there was a, a transition that was taking place and that she promoted in, in every way, which was a, a recognition that it, it was time for us to do something about our own country, especially to to, to focus on it, to 
to take seriously the abuses that were going on in this country and to try to do something about it, particularly the abuses on the vulnerable of any kind um, from law enforcement agencies. And so that, that has been a major focus for all of us since then. Um, but one of our concerns when, when we did this turnabout was that people would imagine that we were <coughs> abandoning our concern for the rest of the world. But that's not what it was. The, she, she helped to make this turnabout a very smooth one and a well understood one because what we, what we aimed to do, and I think we did pretty well, was to show that we weren't turning our back at all on the rest of the world. We were just reconnecting with it in a different way, in a more humble way, in a way that really helped us help others and, and accept help from others in ways that we had never been able to do before. Um, so, I want to, and I, I hadn't mentioned that the biggest challenge, and, and she handled it better than anybody I've ever seen, was to, to keep the peace within, within the board. <laughs> <laughs> board and, and the uh, staff and the membership and all of that, you wouldn't believe how challenging that can be. But, you know, we get it done. And she did it very well. <laughs> so anyway, now more than ever, we, we really need human rights, a focus on human rights, and we need amnesty more than ever. And uh, that means more than ever, amnesty means Margaret. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to introduce our second speaker after, after this, but I, I'll invite Margaret up now. crowd and it's such a testament to Jan. Jan, that was such a kind and, and far too long introduction. <laughs> it's really about you um, and as it should be and it's a great privilege and, and in fact a real pleasure to be here this evening um, to be part of this celebration of Jan Black and her remarkable leadership on human rights and I'd like to thank the Middlebury Institute as well for hosting me tonight. For those of you in the audience who've had the privilege of learning from Jan, and I count myself in that crowd, you'll understand what I mean when I say that Jan is a little bit like the fairy godmother of human rights. You never know where she's going to show up. She will always champion those who need her, and her outfits are fabulous. <laughs> There's no question that Jan has covered the most far-flung corners of our world, shaking her fists at dictators and authoritarian regimes and inspiring young people to take action. From Iran to Bhutan, from Cuba to the Balkans, from East Timor to Chile, Jan has brought her vast knowledge, her wise counsel, and her indomitable spirit to scholars and activists alike. There's no question that we need more human rights champions like Jan today than ever. We're living at a moment when the foundations of the international human rights system, which was created by the United Nations after World War II, the foundations of democratic governance and the rule of law are under threat. Today, in this 70th anniversary year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we are still seeing so many human rights crises. Just last year, in August, the military of Myanmar launched a vicious campaign of ethnic cleansing in response to attacks from an armed group of the Rohingya Salvation Army. 
The military killed women, men, and children. They committed rape and other forms of sexual violence against women and girls. And they systematically burned hundreds of villages. More than 670,000 people fled into Bangladesh in just the course of a couple of months. Since those war crimes took place, the Burmese military has started new construction, building roads and army bases on the Rohingya-owned land so that they have no place to return home. Today, Syria remains in a state of human rights and humanitarian crisis. The United Nations lists more than 9 million Syrians as refugees and internally displaced peoples, making it the largest, but not the only, current refugee crisis in the world. Tens of thousands of civilians across Syria, including children, have been forced to live a terrible life of hardship under siege. Civilians continue to be at the receiving end of frequent indiscriminate attacks by government forces, which also continue to commit other grave violations, including war crimes, such as arbitrary detention, torture, and enforced disappearance. There are also ongoing hostilities and crushing restrictions imposed by the Saudi Arabia-led coalition on Yemen. During three years of Yemen's conflict, all parties have flagrantly violated international law. Civilian lives have been devastated by indiscriminate bombing and shelling, arbitrary detentions, a spiraling humanitarian crisis that has made more than 22 million people reliant on foreign aid to survive. The United States continues to sell military weapons to Saudi Arabia, despite evidence that these weapons have been used by the coalition to kill civilians in the conflict. Yemen is also one of the countries singled out by President Trump's Muslim ban, preventing those who wish to leave this terrible situation from coming to the United States. And here, in the United States, we don't escape these human rights challenges. Refugees and asylum seekers are being thrown in new record numbers in prison for exercising their internationally recognized right to seek safety. Even more incredible, we've seen children forcibly separated from their parents. And there are still today more than 400 kids who have not been reunited with their families despite a court order deadline in July. As of this week, 16 people have been executed in the United States this year, all by lethal injection. And there are 13 more scheduled to be executed before the end of 2018. According to the CDC, more than 38,000 people died of gun violence in 2016. Among those killed in 2017 were more than 3,900 children and teenagers. And just this week, the president raised the possibility of making protest illegal in the United States. In case you're hoping that this might just be wishful thinking, <coughs> you should know that since November 2016, 31 states have introduced legislation to restrict or criminalize peaceful protest. Nine have adopted legislation. Additionally, last year, the White House issued an executive order reinstating a program that transfers surplus military equipment to police departments, including weaponized vehicles, large caliber ammunition, riot gear, all of which are once again allowed to be used to respond to protests. So this is a pretty dire picture, and we're really not supposed to be so gloomy and doomy tonight. Um, so what gives me hope when I think about all of these challenges around the world? That would be human rights activism, just like the work that Jan has done consistently over so many years. 
Let me share a bit with you about Amnesty's activism and how it works. As one example of our campaigns, Amnesty International ho hosts a Right for Rights International Day on December 10th, the International Day for Human Rights. Right for Rights is actually writing letters for human rights. And each year, hundreds of thousands of people around the world write millions of letters. There are two kinds of letters. Half of them go to governments who are oppressing human rights defenders or locking them up. The other half are solidarity letters that are delivered to people who are behind bars for expressing their opinions and for their identity. In this day and age, you wouldn't think that writing letters would have the same power as it might have done in years past. But incredibly, each year, governments do respond when they're targeted by hundreds of thousands of letters from around the world demanding that they change. Let me share with you a couple of the people whom Amnesty has helped. Moses Akatuba was a 16-year-old in Nigeria when he was arrested under suspicion of armed robbery in 2005. He spent three months in police detention where he says that police officers repeatedly beat him with machetes and batons. He told Amnesty that they tied and hung him up for several hours and then used pliers to pull out his toe and his fingernails. Finally, Moses agreed to sign two pre-written confessions. And in 2013, he was sentenced to death. Just a reminder, stealing cell phones. In the 2014 Right for Rights, activists around the world took more than 800,000 actions on Moses' behalf. Today, he is a free man and going to school in Nigeria. In July 2012, Yesenia Armenta was taken into police custody in Mexico and brutally tortured. The police beat her for hours, they raped her, and they threatened to kill her children if she did not confess to committing a crime. In spite of independent medical evidence that torture took place, the so-called confession was used to charge her, and she was held behind bars for several years. In 2016, Yesenia was released after Amnesty championed her case with letters. On his 69th birthday in 2016, Louisiana prisoner Albert Woodfox walked free. For 44 years, he served in solitary confinement in the Angola prison in Louisiana, longer than any other prisoner in isolation. Nearly every day for more than half his life, Albert woke up in a cell the size of a parking lot. After more than four decades, he was our featured Right for Rights campaign in 2015, and today he is walking freely in the United States. Also in the US, many immigrant families are being held in detention facilities, such as the Berks County Residential Center in Pennsylvania. Many most of these immigrants actually come from a region known as the Northern Triangle of Central America, which includes El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Northern Triangle is an area widely recognized for its extreme levels of violence and insecurity, which Amnesty has documented extensively. Last year, a three-year-old and his 28-year-old mother, Teresa, fled kidnapping threats and physical and sexual assault in Honduras before arriving in the United States seeking asylum. They were put in jail. They were put in the Burks residential facility for more than 16 months. Jose, the little boy, spent more than half of his young life in detention, learning to walk and talk in confinement. Last fall, Amnesty campaigned to win their release, 
and today they are fighting their case for asylum outside the detention center. As a Peace Corps volunteer, and as an educator and author, and of course, as a board member of Amnesty, Jan has walked the walk every day, showing us by her actions and her voice that she will stand up for human rights. And her leadership is more important today than ever, because we can't take our rights for granted, not here in the United States, not anywhere in the world. Right now, there is a really strong sense of division across the country. No matter how you feel about our political system, everyone can agree that reaching consensus on important national issues is getting harder and harder. And often it seems the politicians are trying to divide us rather than trying to bring us together. Our Bill of Rights guarantees the right to freedom of speech which is also one of the fundamental rights guaranteed under international human rights law. But today, we see government officials attacking journalists. We see police forces using tear gas and attack dogs against peaceful protesters. And that's why I am so thrilled to be here tonight for the launch of the Jan Nippers Black Fund for Human Rights Protection. This fund will support education and awareness raising about human rights. It will support young people who are starting their careers in human rights work. And it will honor those who have made an incredible impact in the field of human rights. So on behalf of my board of directors and our more than one million activists and members in the United States, I want to express my deep gratitude to Jan for her incredible gifts and her generous spirit and for creating this fund and helping all of us. We at Amnesty often like to say, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Jan, you've lit a powerful flame and it is my honor to stand with you and fight the darkness together. Thank you. tell you all that this is being live streamed. Now, I don't really understand what that means, but sure it is. I just never really fit in the 21st century. Just didn't see that. <laughs> but um, anyway, one of the reasons that I thought it was a good idea to bring Margaret and, and Bill together was because when I, I think that when the saints go marching in, they better go together, you know, for their safety. <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, our majority leader of the state senate needs no introduction anywhere in the state of California. But um, I. <laughs> I imagine that there are some of you who don't really know that he has been an advocate and an, and an activist in human rights all his life, uh, particularly around here, but also um, he, he did a lot of work for Central America in the 80s when the United States was making war on democracy in that area. And even before that in the 60s he was working with Cesar Chavez and, and the farm workers to try to find a little justice in the field. And uh, anyway, he's, he has worked in human rights in many ways, in many times, and so forth. 
I imagine that most of you know that he was for many years uh, a mem member of the faculty of the Monterey Institute. And it was wonderful having him here, but I applaud the uh, intelligence of all of us to have let him go and to so we can have a, a really serious champion of human rights in the legislature. And uh, so he has done amazing things for us there. And, and uh, I think particularly he understands and has always acted upon the idea of bringing human rights home. And so I think he's a very appropriate one to to tell us a little bit more about that. Not just the why to do it, well he knows that, we know that, but how do we do it? And uh, so. Well, thank you, Jan, and good evening to all of you. Thank you for all being here. Uh, as we launch the establishment this evening of the Jan Nippers Black Fund for Human Rights Protection. I want to especially thank the Middlebury Institute of International Studies and the Amnesty International Chapter here at MIS for your organizing and hosting this evening's event, and to the co-sponsoring organizations, the United Nations Association, the MIS Amnesty International Student Club, and the Peace Coalition of Monterey County. I also want to thank, from afar, Dean Jeff Dayton Johnson, uh, Professor Laura Burian, and Juan Sanchez. Let's thank them for their amazing music. <laughs> their second song, Kila Payun, uh, has played uh, a lot. So if you have a Kila Payun album, you can find it. And I also want to thank in advance the music of the Heartstrings, who will be playing and entertaining for us at the reception uh, immediately following the program this evening. I want to thank the organizers. They've been thanked, but I think uh, further thanks is in order for Shirley, Lene, Aaron, Ava, Barbara, Jason, and everyone who helped bring this together uh, in relatively short order, let's give them another big thank you. And my very special thanks to Margaret Huang for joining us, uh, for gracing us with your presence and the sobering update, but also the light that you bring, and more important than your presence tonight, your leadership every day every year. Let's thank Margaret. It's a great honor for me to return home. I'm technically on leave of absence as a faculty member. Um, I keep reminding people of that because there's been turnover in leadership and I have to make sure somebody remembers that I'm on leave of absence. But to be here this evening is particularly important to me to honor Professor Jan Black for her years of dedication and leadership as an academic, as an advocate, and as an activist in the cause of human rights protection. From her work as a member on the boards of directors of Amnesty International, the United Nations Association, Global Majority, Peace and Justice Center, and the executive board of the State Democratic Party, to her leadership as a professor activist who's taught and mentored hundreds if not thousands of students it's absolutely historically appropriate and historically imperative that Jan's decades of work and commitment be carried forward by the establishment of a fund in her name. I've had the honor and privilege of knowing Jan as a friend, as an academic colleague here at the Institute, and as an ally on many fronts. In Jan's work with Global Majority, 
She's accompanied Ms. students to conflict resolution forums, trainings in human rights activism, and engagement with the Mapuche community in southern Chile, and in partnership with our good friend and Global Majority Board member, Juan Judge Juan Guzman Tapia, and with other Global Majority leaders, many of whom were educated here and benefited from Jan's mentorship. Jan's ability to be a contributor to both the academic study of human rights as an effective advocate and activist represents a rare combination. We often rely on the work of academics to inform our activism, or we look to activists to carry forward in the real world that which too often stays confined to the sanctuaries of academia. Jan has led in both and all arenas where human rights are being taught, explained, projected, and protected. And as is envisioned by the development of the Fund for Human Rights Protection, we recognize that the struggle for human rights is not limited to the struggles of people and communities in foreign lands, but also to victims of rights violations here in the United States, in California, and in Monterey County. As a member of the California State Senate, with Jan's steadfast support, I've been able to work to address that connectivity of some of the struggles in Sacramento, where in recent years, we've carried and passed landmark legislation on climate change, police practices, prison reform, immigration protections, and the impacts of poverty. You may wonder why I mentioned climate change as linked with human rights. Unfortunately, it is not much of a stretch. It is often marginalized communities of color, including immigrant communities, who are the first to suffer the public health impacts of climate change, including poor air quality, contaminated water, fires, and often inhumane working conditions in fields and factories that are reaching unbearable temperatures with no relief from air conditioning or other protections. The common denominators in these connected impacts is poverty, racism, sexism, exploitation and abuse, and often the persecution of those who take a stand and who stand up to fight for protected rights. I'm proud to report that the state of California and Governor Jerry Brown will be hosting the Climate Action Summit next week in San Francisco, where we will host the international community and representatives of other states who have been shunned by the callous actions of the current occupant of the White House, who is the only world leader to unilaterally pull a nation out of the unanimous consent agreement reached at the Paris Climate Conference. A number of plenary and special sessions We'll look at the linkage among labor rights, public health, the environment including our oceans, wildfires, and extreme weather events. Indeed, climate change represents the ultimate threat to the most fundamental human right, the right to life and human survival. In Sacramento, we have also worked to establish the state's reporting obligations under international human rights treaties. While in the State Assembly, I carried Assembly Concurrent Resolution 129 that recognizes the duty of our state's Attorney General to publicize specified international human rights treaties and protocols to cities, counties, and state agencies to inform them of their reporting duties to the United Nations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and Additional Protocols. All of these treaty obligations ratified by the U.S. Senate are part and parcel of our domestic laws and enforceable as domestic laws under the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution. 
This resolution, the one I just mentioned, was brought to us by civil liberties and human rights champion Ann Fagan Ginger of the Micklejohn Civil Liberties Institute. We need only to look to California's continued death penalty laws, solitary confinement, police shootings of predominantly young males of color, overcrowded jails and prisons, child trafficking, and the separation of immigrant children from their parents to understand that human rights protections must be enforced at home and abroad. I'm also proud to report that the California State Legislature just passed a resolution carried by Assemblywoman Monique Limon in the Assembly and by me in the Senate at the conclusion of this legislative session last week. Joint Resolution Number 33 relative to nuclear weapons communicates to the U.S. Congress and the President the will of the people of California to embrace the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. That was a landmark treaty achieved last year in a campaign led by a former student of Jam Black's and Professor Bill Potters of the Center of Nonproliferation Studies here at MIS, Ambassador Elaine White, the Costa Rican diplomat whose effective and tireless diplomacy led to this landmark achievement in the United Nations and which contributed to the award of the Nobel Peace Prize to the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. You will shortly hear from Ambassador White on another delivered message to Jan. There's a saying in politics that all politics are local. Jan Black learned this at an early age from her father, who was also a state senator and who I had the honor of meeting. He was affectionately referred to as judge by his friends and community members in Tennessee. He raised Jan to respect the human and civil rights of all people. And just as all politics are local, so are all human rights ultimately local. But as we challenge human rights violations at home, we must use our privilege and resources to support and campaign for our sisters and brothers who are the victims of human rights abuses abroad. Those who have shown the courage to stand up often have nobody covering their backs. They look to us, they look to the international community, and those of us who have the ability and the power to engage. I received the support from Amnesty International in 1983 when we led a delegation to El Salvador to secure, to negotiate the release of Professor Ricardo Calderon. He was one of the many disappeared. During his disappearance, he was tortured. He also signed a confession, a pre-prepared confession under duress when they brought him the ear of a child and they told him that it was his son's ear and that they would continue to bring body parts of his infant son until he signed the confession. He signed the confession, he was remanded to Mariona prison in an international campaign led by Amnesty International focused on then U.S. Ambassador Pickering and then President Alvaro Magana in San Salvador. I had the honor of leading a delegation, there were four of us, we flew into San Salvador, but the power that helped us secure Ricardo's release was the use of fax machines. Kind of an antiquated communication <laughs> system now. But we targeted the U.S. Embassy and Alvaro Magana's presidential palace, and the faxes were coming from the U.S from Mexico, from Central America, from Canada, from Japan, from Europe, from all over the world. And when we finally got to negotiate with Magana, he said, you have to stop jamming our communication system. He said, we're a country at war. But it was Amnesty International that elevated his case to an urgent action campaign that was the power that gave us any negotiating power with the ambassador and with the president of four unknowns who had traveled from California. 
I just want to close again by turning our focus this evening to the woman that we honor and the fund that we establish. Professor Jan Black has demonstrated by how she has lived her life that we are all indeed connected. She's used her knowledge and experience in an unselfish manner to educate, involve, and activate generations of students who are today's human rights activists and practitioners. At this time, I'd also like to recognize Professor Martin Needler, Jan's husband, who has served as a collaborator, a co-conspirator, <laughs> Successful woman, there's <laughs> <laughs> But Marty, we thank you for your collaboration in sharing Jan with us and supporting her in her fights and struggles all these years. Once again, thank you, Marty. <laughs> and it is now my honor to recognize the establishment of the Jan Nippers Black Fund for Human Rights Protection by presenting a California State Senate certificate, Jan, please come forward, that recognizes the establishment of the fund and the importance of Jan Black's leadership through the years. I usually don't read whereases, but this one is relatively short, so I'm gonna close by sharing this with you, Jan, and reading it so people can hear this recognition from the California State Senate and the people of the state of California, who rec the recognition of Professor Jan Nippers Black for her leadership and commitment in the field of human rights research, advocacy, and teaching, including her work as a member of the boards of directors of Amnesty International, Global Majority, the United Nations Association of Monterey County, the California Democratic Party, and as a teacher, friend, and ally made me lose my place, of so students and graduates of the Monterey and Middlebury Institutes of International Study, who now lead human rights campaigns around the world. The fund will work to support the continued efforts of Professor Jan Black to promote not only human rights around the world and at home, but also to promote the human dignity and worth of all people. Thank you, Jan, for your years of work, leadership, and inspiration with love, admiration, and respect, the California State Senate. I came to Nice in 1991. My special interest then was development of Latin America. I came to Nice in 1991. My special interest then was development of Latin America. I was passionate about discovering regional economic integration as a development tool. It was mandatory then that I took Jan Black's classes on development in Latin America. I discovered this warm person 
who at the same time was tough when reading, grading my papers. <laughs> and she continuously encouraged us to go beyond the textbook, to understand reality, to talk to the people, to see with our own eyes, to go to the source. And for Jan, the source is the people living their lives throughout the world. She does it not only for us to develop critical thinking, but also to develop our humanity. As a diplomat of Costa Rica, a country that had historically championed the respect and fulfillment of human rights throughout the world and domestically, I am privileged to represent my country at the United Nations Office in Geneva, which is the global hub of human rights, including the UN Human Rights Council. Through my work, I see that there is so much progress we have achieved throughout human history, but so much to do to stop human suffering wherever it occurs. You understand that you need warm, passionate, free-spirited, free-thinkers like Professor Jan Black to go and work in the field of human rights with a passion and conviction that has defined her. When I think of the best way to describe her legacy in all of us, I say that she wants everyone to understand that all humans are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And that is the utmost truth. I thank you, Jan. Thank you, Elaine. And I, I do know where she is. She's in Geneva. She just left about a week ago. Um, I uh, well, there are a lot of a lot of reasons for for teaching, for for being in an institution like this one. And uh, they did pay salaries, you know. <laughs> Maybe not always wonderful, but yeah, they pay. But that's not the pay that matters. Yeah. That's the pay. <laughs> yeah, what uh, the, kind, the kind of thing that a, a student of mine would say, like that, and accomplish like that. Wow, that's, that's just priceless. Um, you, most of you have probably heard something about the fact that I I'm not being encouraged to buy any green bananas these days. Um, my, my doctors have been telling me that I am already now living on board time. Um, and I'm here tonight to embarrass the hell out of <laughs> They don't know what kind of bank I'm going to. <laughs> As it turns out, that bank is is you. Um, that, that, that borrowed time, what I, I'm, I'm borrowing it from you. It's the energy that I get, and uh, it, it well. You all have been just shamelessly pampering me for two years now. <laughs> this is wonderful. Uh, please keep it up, it's working. <laughs> what an uh, join me upstairs right away, please, for for wonderful food and drink and music. <laughs> So, I hope to have a chance to talk with all of you before you get out of here.